Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world, with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. Under the 30-year rule, cabinet papers from the miners' strike in 1984 have just been released. The papers show that Margaret Thatcher was lying to the population about what really happened in the strike, and that Arthur Scargill was, indeed, the one telling the truth. The year-long strike, which began 30 years ago, was an historical epic, which changed Britain for the worse, and in which I battled every single day as an honorary member of the National Union of Mine Workers for most of my life. One of my comrades in that battle went on to write the book about Thatcher's war against hundreds of thousands of decent, hard-working British citizens, whom she described as the enemy within. The title of the book published by Verso and updated and to be reissued in March of this year. The author and associate editor of the Guardian newspaper, Seamus Milne, is our first guest on the Sputnik. But before that, Gayatri took a walk along Great Russell Street in London, towards the museum. No, not the British Museum, the Trade Union Congress, to talk about the 30th anniversary of the most important struggle by organised labour in Britain's history. But oddly, you didn't find much interest amongst the brothers and sisters there. Surprisingly, or perhaps not so surprisingly, not indeed. As we were standing outside the POC, I saw the security looking at us, so I thought I'd give him a friendly note saying that we're just standing outside on the pavement to interview your workers about this big miner strike from 30 years ago. He was making such a fuss out of it, saying that we needed permission and that people had already complained about the nuisance, even though we were only standing there for one minute getting ready. As all the people came out of the building for lunch, the vast majority just rejected to be interviewed about the miners' strike, and some even used the argument that they had nothing to do with it. Imagine that the TUC people had nothing to do with the miners' strike, the biggest strike in British history. And you see, before the miners' strike, the TUC was a giant in the land. Now it is a dwarf, and the reason is because the miners lost. And one of the reasons they lost is because the TUC didn't lift a finger to help them. But two people, I think, Today? did agree yeah. to speak. Let's see what they had to say. I think it um, divided this country very badly. I think the miners were treated extremely badly. I think the government lied about what they were doing. And we're now finding out that that, that was the case, which a lot of us suspected at the time. Yeah, it was obviously uh, targeted at the trade union movement, particularly the miners. And um, of course, it went on to the print, etc. And we are where we are now where trade unions seem to be a dirty word in society, when in actual fact they're not. Scargill was very much demonised back then. He, he, he was very much, um, but then anybody who takes a stand against uh, government tends to be demonised. Do you think that Ed Milburn should pledge for a public inquiry now? Yes. Do you think he will? No. <laughs> <laughs> because? Um, I don't think there would be very many votes in it. And I think the right-wing press would rip them to pieces. During that time, you had the sinking of the Belgrano. Uh, you had all these sort of things going on. You had Margaret Thatcher visiting South Africa, as opposed to a banning apartheid and sanctions. You had a lot of things going on that time. And, yeah, an inquiry into this would possibly draw out some of that other stuff as well. Thank you for... Yes. And may she rest in peace or hell, wherever she is. But, yeah, <laughs> there should be an inquiry. <laughs> May she rest in peace or in hell. With Seamus Milne, I could discuss that all day, but that's probably too theological uh, an argument. Tell us first, Seamus, about the 30-year rule, the papers that have just been released, and what new they tell us. Well, every year um, the government releases uh, cabinet and, and, and government papers from 30 years previously, and sometimes they do it a bit earlier nowadays as well. And sometimes, in fact, quite often, they don't release the papers at all because they're too embarrassing. And this year, they released a lot of stuff about 1984. That was 30 years ago, and about the miners' strike, which began in 1984 and went on for a year. And in those papers, uh, there are certainly 
very important confirmations of things that had been widely suspected but not known for certain. Like, for example, uh, the fact that Thatcher had a plan to send in the army to keep coal stocks moving because, and this is a very crucial point, I think, that's often misunderstood by people who were quite supportive of the miners at the time, which is that the strike came very close to succeeding on more than one occasion and the government was in a panic that not only fuel supplies would run out and there would be blackouts, but that food supplies would run out. Um, so that's one thing that comes out of it. Another thing that comes out of the papers is that it was said at the time by the miners' leadership, not just Arthur Scargill, but him in particular, uh, that there was a secret hit list, hit list to close 75 um, coal mines. And that was denied by the coal board at the time, by the government. It was said to be an appalling lie by the miners' leadership. They were manipulating and misleading their followers, the media echoed all that, and of course it's revealed that there was indeed such a hit list. There are other things besides confirmation that the government manipulated the media, that the security services, MI5 in particular, were heavily involved in operations uh, against the strike, and for example that the government was planning to charge the miners' leaders, uh, Arthur Scargill, personally with incitement to riot uh, and they only pulled back from it because they realized it might make the situation worse but I think what all that underlines is this was a, a mighty confrontation uh, between the state uh, and organized labor in a form that really hadn't happened since the general strike in 1926 and certainly hasn't happened since it was a watershed in modern British history. It was a battle not only about coal mines and, and, uh, and fuel, and of course the arguments changed about that in the years since as climate change has become a crucial issue, but it was about how Britain is run and whether or not the market-led neoliberal model of capitalism, which has since been imposed on us, was going to be uh, w was going to run riot, which is of course what happened after the strike. So I think it is a very important part of British history and it's one in which there are important lessons for us all to this day. And yet when we were at the TUC Vox popping yesterday, these were the only two uh, people who would speak about the strike. And yet its epic character ought to be felt most keenly amongst uh, trade unionists because trade unionists then, as compared to now, were of course a force in the land then and very much not now. Well, I think the trade union movement was divided then in a political way more than it is perhaps today and there was a very strong right wing at that time among trade union leaders and leaderships uh, who were very opposed to the miners and the miners leaders and their militancy and their political trade unionism. Uh, and didn't like Arthur Scargill, didn't like Peter Heathfield, didn't like Mick McGarhy, the three main leaders of the strike. Uh, and they felt that the strike was undermining of the TUC's attempt to appear reasonable and be accommodating with employers in the new environment of that time, the new class and economic environment. And they thought it was undermining for the Labour leadership. As you'll remember, Neil Kinnock was then the Labour leader and he was trying to... He was beginning the new Labour He was really uh, yeah, starting the whole new Labour thing, although it wasn't called that then. And he himself... Uh, could not abide Arthur Scargill. He didn't believe that the miners should be having this fight. Uh, he thought they were running it in the wrong way. And he himself, to this day, believes that he never became prime minister because of the miners' strike. So I think that's all reflected among people in, in people's attitudes. Um, they find Scargill's <coughs> personality too, confr too confrontational. They think his tactics were wrong. But I think that's really to misunderstand the nature of the confrontation. There wasn't an easy compromise. There wasn't a traditional trade union accommodation available. The government of the day, Margaret Thatcher and the Tories, went for the miners because they were uniquely powerful. They controlled 80% of Britain's power supply. Mm -hmm. uh, they were led by a... Uh, an ideological leader. Well, they were not just Scargill, but they were led by a highly politicised group of leaders and activists um, who were prepared to fight uh, for their industry, for their communities, for their jobs, in a way that other trade unionists weren't. But actually, they didn't have the option in 1984, 1985, <coughs> of going for a gentle rundown of the industry. They were, they were basically faced with the alternative of a full-on confrontation and a crushing of their industry and their jobs and their communities, or resistance. And they took the path of resistance. And as I was saying, the strike 
came much closer to success than is understood or that than was understood at the time. It's, it's available in lots and lots of bits of evidence. Well, nowhere better uh, than in your book, The Enemy Within, which is not just the book of the strike, but uh, one of the books of the 1980s period, which was so profoundly important uh, in Britain. Uh, I remember every day uh, almost uh, of the strike, but many watching this will not. Just say a bit briefly, if you will, about what Britain was like during that 12 months. Well, it was a confrontation that was played out in the coalfield areas, which are not uh, in the main population centres by and large in the country. So it was played out in South Wales, in Scotland, in Yorkshire, in Derbyshire, and of course in Nottinghamshire. And one of the crucial problems of the strike was that a section of the miners mainly based in Nottinghamshire, who thought that their pits would survive if they continued working and played ball with the government. They continued working, and that was the crucial uh, Achilles heel of the strike. Uh, so these, these were confrontations that were played out every day uh, on the picket line between a very violent and aggressive police force that was trying on behalf of the government to keep pits open in areas where miners were still working. And the large majority of miners who were on strike, more than 150,000 of them who were on strike for more than a year, were trying to close those pits and make the strike effective. And because the government had decided not mainly to use the law, because they feared that would, it was too controversial at the time, and the new anti-trade union laws as they were then, they thought that would inflame the strike and spread it, and all their concentration was trying to restrict the strike. Uh, they used the police as a battering ram to try and crush the miners. So there were very violent confrontations. You know, 11 people died in the strike, but there were multiple uh, frontline confrontations in places like Orgreave in Yorkshire, uh, where day after day thousands of pickets fought the police. And of course, for people in other parts of the country where nothing like this was happening, this was all quite bizarre in a way. It was, a, it was kind of like a civil war taking place somewhere mm. else. But for many, many millions of people in Britain, they understood what was at stake. And it was a very divisive dispute in public opinion at the time. But between 30 and 40 percent of the British population always supported the miners and the strike. The system that was imposed after the strike, uh, the Thatcherite economics, the neoliberal model, which has caused such devastation to communities, not only in Britain, but of course throughout the world, crashed and burned in 2008 in the crisis that we're living through still today and was exposed to be a failure. And that was what the, the minor strike battle was really about. Do you think there will be a public inquiry? Into the strike? Uh, I don't think so, but I think it would be very worthwhile. But I fear that some of the things that we're talking about, the most sensitive things, wouldn't even be released uh, for that inquiry. But well, you'll get them in here. They are in there. Reissued in March. The new edition of The Enemy Within. With new material. <coughs> With new material. <laughs> of course. Updated. Uh, it's a fascinating uh, story, and you're the very best person to tell it. Seamus Milne, thanks very much. Now, if you're smart, you've already read Seamus Milne's magnificent article in The Guardian last Thursday about World War I. After the break, we'll be talking to a real live soldier who knows all about real war. Unlike the pipsqueak politicians, trying to terrorise our history masters into a parade ground formation lined up in defence of the war. Stay tuned, I promise you, you won't want to miss it. Welcome back. Education Secretary Michael Gove couldn't fight his own way out of a paper bag, but he's been lobbing verbal grenades at everyone from film directors to Mr Bean. From the late Alan Clark, author of The Donkeys, and his former Conservative colleague to just about every historian in the land. He thinks questioning the donkeys and the mass slaughter over which they presided is, well, unpatriotic. Joe Glenton, on the other hand, was a real fighter in Afghanistan until he refused to do it anymore on the grounds that it was an unjust war and, moreover, doomed to last longer than the First and Second World Wars put together and for no real purpose. He was sent to the glass house for his trouble, spending six months in total behind bars. Now a free man, he prefers to speak like one. And writing in The Guardian this week, he talked about the World War I from the point of view of Tommy Atkins, the proverbial eponymous British private soldier. And I'm glad to have him here with us. Joe, you're a, a, an anti-war hero. Uh, you are at pains in your book, Soldier Box, not to claim you were a war hero. 
but you have become a hero for those of us in the anti-war movement because you had the courage to stand up, think for yourself, and speak for yourself. Of course, in the First World War, where millions were militarized and millions were killed, uh, there were also conscientious objectors, just like you. Tell us about them. Uh, well, there were, you know, all, there were all kinds of reasons that people refused in the in the First World War. Some of them did so on religious grounds, some on political grounds, but um, they were, you know, treated routinely very, very badly. They were for, executed. At the front, some of them were they? executed, and they were, some of them were, were imprisoned, and they were tried, and they were made a mockery of and pilloried in public. Um, and yet, even when today, when particularly people in government talk about conscientious objection, they still three, see it through that prism of World War One, and that's something I try to address. That we have to understand, conscientious objection is not a shouldn't be seen as that radical a thing. It's a right. It's a legal and contractual right. In fact, the army of the three services is unique in that it has in Queen's regulations, the, the governing body of laws, the, uh, the, it says that you're allowed to be a conscientious objector. It's uh, something you're, you're allowed to do. And yet the vast majority in the First World War marched off straw hats, trumpets, beating of drums. Uh, it was to be a glorious affair and it was all to be over by Christmas, but it didn't work out like that. No, it didn't work out that, and it's very interesting when we look at the actual reasons, and it's, it's obviously a heavily kind of mystified period of history, but when we look at the actual reasons, and you can find Tommy Atkins' voice if you look hard enough in memoirs of, of, um, of non-commissioned soldiers, um, it, at the start it was still a mix, as it is today, of, of economic reasons and also the ideological stuff, the idea that war is somehow heroic and military service is heroic and it was about king and country and we see that stuff now being reprised effectively we see that with the whole kind of hero industry which is emerging and the lionization of soldiers which distracts completely from the fact that these are normal people who've been who've been uh, tricked in many cases normal young people often they want to go and help other people you know uh, there are, there's a kind of a germ of a noble um, noble cause in there, but these people are uh, tricked into serving. Amazingly, uh, many of the soldiers who enlisted in droves in the First World War were doing so because it gave them clothes uh, when they didn't have any, gave them three meals a day when they certainly didn't have any, gave them a roof over their head that didn't leak, and not many of them had that hitherto. And yet when I read your book, these were amongst the reasons why you and your fellow soldiers uh, were happy to join the army. Exactly, yeah, I mean, very much the case, nearly across the board. I mean, most of the guys I served with, we're talking about guys from uh, what, former industrial towns in Scotland and the north of England which were smashed by Thatcher, and these are guys who, who, who want to kind of make something of themselves. And if you're a working-class guy like I was, one of the only routes available to do that is, is the military. It's always been the case. Um, and also, I mean, it, we're still experiencing, much as the veterans in the First World War did, when you leave the military, then you're not a hero anymore. No one's interested anymore. Uh, we see the amount of veterans who are homeless in London, the amount of veterans in prison. So you're, you're useful. The, the wounds and the hardships of the soldier have always been politically useful for a short time, and then you're forgotten. Well, see, Joe, this, it's one thing for a soldier to start thinking for himself, and it's another to actually act upon it, and, like, you leave the whole army in war. Were there many fellow soldiers that thought the one thing but weren't strong enough to get to the second push? I think so. I think a lot of guys... I mean, the, the reality of warfare in Afghanistan or in Iraq would, would strips away the kind of rationale you're given as a soldier. Within a very short period of time of being in Afghanistan, it's very clear that we weren't there to help little brown girls go to school and we weren't there to build infrastructure. Um, and that reality check affects everyone. Um, some guys... Um, you know, go completely the other way to me, and they, they start to kind of really believe it, and they become true believers and buy into worse. this stuff. Yeah, for sure. You'll see, you know, the, there are military guys on the far right nowadays, and, and it, it kind of, the experience of war will tear you apart, and you will go one way or another when that happens. Some people end up buying into it, and it ends up that their politics are completely based around the fact that they were a soldier, and they see the world through that prism. Other guys, and this is increasingly the case with uh, Veterans for Peace, which is an organisation I'm involved in. People go the other way, and we've got we're now 100 plus in our ranks, if you like, uh, and we're absolutely committed to to speaking truth to the issue of war. And we go into schools, and we do all kinds of activism and campaigns to uh, to bust the myths around war. And do you get a good reception from that in schools? Well, yeah. I mean, uh, the best thing we find is just to tell stories. Um, kids get it when you tell stories. You don't have to go into the the kind of politics and theoretical stuff, no. you just tell your experience of what it's actually like. And that helps to strip away a lot of the kind of jingoistic myths which surround war 
today that it's if they read in their history books of for course. sure yeah. yeah I mean and increasingly that's going to be the case with Gove's project well, yeah, well Gove wants to rewrite the history books mm. of course mm. and uh, any questioning of the First World War he deems uh, unpatriotic but as you pointed out in your brilliant Guardian article this week this uh, parade of politicians uh, is akin to looting the bodies of the fallen uh, on the battlefield they're seeking to in the most grubby way possible to garner votes for themselves and for their party off the suffering uh, of the soldiers for sure yeah and i think that there's a whole history of this as i said the soldier is useful for a while he's useful and every lots of people in power whether in the media or, or in politics seek to be seen as the soldier's friend but that's always um mm. you know very, it's, that's a passing fad while they can milk it for for votes they will but it doesn't last and if you, you can look at if you look at history other than govian history you'll find that that's the case that the soldier is used and abused when i entered parliament more than a quarter of a century ago there were lots of old soldiers uh, on the benches. I remember so vividly Dennis Healy, former Labour leader, a major in the landing at Anzio, warning against the first Iraq war uh, in 1991, warning that uh, Murphy's Law would uh, apply, that anything that could go wrong would go wrong. Uh, and you could almost smell the cordite uh, on his clothes as he described the hell of war. I'm just wondering, you as a former soldier working at the sharp end what soldiers think about the politicians most of whom nowadays are these pipsqueaks that i talked about they wouldn't know how to fight their way out of a paper bag i know that because i regularly challenge them to a fight they always run away <laughs> but none of them have served in action none of them have heard the boom of the guns the monstrous uh, rattle uh, of the guns I'm wondering if soldiers feel contempt for the politicians that make the decisions that send them into harm's way or whether there's a, a kind of reverence to them. Well, I think there's a, there's a very broad range of opinion within the military on that. Um, you know, there are some guys who, who, kind, of, uh, who kind of accept that and, and you're trained to, uh, to, you're told to, you're not political, your job isn't political, which for me now looking back is ridiculous. There's nothing more political than war obviously um and other guys are, are openly contemptuous but i think what happens often is that guys kind of they, they kind of internalize this idea that you're just a soldier you don't question orders even though they they do have these questions building up inside them and often what happens is when they come back and leave the military they have these these contradictions have become very apparent to them because of the reality of war but they don't act on them and so very often these guys will be kind of churning internally for many many years and, and part of what we do with Veterans for Peace is try to reach out to these guys and talk to these people um, and, uh, and kind of engage them because th those are the most critical voices there are. Uh, and and it, obviously Tommy Atkins' voice completely undercuts the voices of uh, the very few veterans that there are, I think, in, in, uh, in Parliament. Fantastic. Veterans for Peace. Joe Glenton, author of Soldier Box, published by Verso, available uh, as an e-book also as well as in the best uh, bookshops. Thanks very much for joining us on board the Sputnik. Thank you. Well, now it's your turn. We deal with the social media review coming in through our portal, RT underscore Sputnik. Gayatri, what's rattling? A lot. On the war, for example, Andy Gilchrist says that the ruling class had millions die in their imperial carved up row. Indeed, uh, they were all cousins. With the same grandmother. Yes, indeed. On the minor strike, Tyke Tyke says the TUC fat cats since 1926 were inside the tent. The NUM were outside the tent and were on the hit list. Well, don't get me started on the TUC. I think I've probably <laughs> said enough about them, at least in public. Scott C. Forbes says, is it a coincidence that South Yorkshire are at the heart of both Hillsborough and minor strike cover-up? Well, the police and the chiefs of police uh, at both Hillsborough and at Orgreave, which was the great Yorkshire battle between the pickets and the police, which was falsified even by the BBC with reverse footage mm. showing the miners attacking the police when in fact it was the police on horseback who attacked the miners. Uh, there's a lot of overlap and we've had a public inquiry into Hillsborough. Now we need one over our grief and indeed the wider issues of the strike. But will we get it? That's the question. No, as the Vox Pop uh, 
uh, subject said, because uh, the right-wing press would probably tear Miliband to pieces over it. On the other hand, it would be a big energizer of the core Labour vote if Miliband were to promise one. Ross MacDonald then says, Michael Gov right. Three words that should never be used in the same sentence, at least not without extreme and wing. Well, he's very funny, Michael Gove. He was himself once a striker. He spent a whole year Did himself he? on strike as a journalist at the uh, Aberdeen newspaper. He was a militant in the National Union of Journalists, spent a whole year locked out. Uh, but uh, he's a uh, conservative to the marrow of his bones and an increasingly right-wing one and belligerent one. Mm. That's all the tweets we got for this week. Which, alas, means that's all the time we've got. Do keep in touch with us, though, on, our, on Twitter at RT underscore Sputnik and now also on Facebook, so find us at Sputnik on Russia Today. That's it for me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous.